This is Duke University. All right, I guess everybody's ready to start. We got quiet a moment ago. <laughs> Let's jump in. I think that's great. Um, we have a really exciting uh, set of activities planned today. This is the last in the series of seminars, uh, the Leading Edge seminars, and this one's focused on Smart Grid. We had uh, enormous interest in the students uh, uh, to participate in this, so you were amongst the, uh, the few, the crowd that made it in. There were a lot of people who wanted to be here today. So it's great to see you all here. Um, I think we have a fantastic program planned. Um, we have uh, Peter Fox Penner from the Brattle Group who will be doing our opening presentation to give a sense of the landscape of Smart Grid and some of the issues um, related to this really fast growing dynamic area. Uh, we'll do that um, and we'll leave plenty of time for uh, Q&A with Peter at the end because he's a real um, expert, internationally recognized expert in this area. Many of you might know he published the book called Smart Power, which came out in the last uh, year or so. Um, and there are flyers available. I'll put them at the back um, if you're interested in ordering the book after Peter's presentation. Um, second uh, phase of the seminar, we will do a panel discussion. Um, all of you received the bios, so we're not going to spend a lot of time doing the formalities. I think there's enough content to chew on here. Hopefully you all had a chance to know um, who, who you, uh, you're going to be hearing from and a chance to really engage with them around these topics. And we, we have um, Dahlia Patino here from the Nicholas School who will be moderating the panel. And then third, we'll go into breakout groups and um, explore some of these issues in, in more depth. So um, sort of typical structure for the Leading Edge Seminar. I'm really excited to have um, Peter here. He's um, well known in this community. In fact, as uh, people found out that he was coming to Duke, I found many people who had been his students in the past or uh, colleagues working with him in various capacities. Um, so a, a, a real expert who's been in this area for a long time and really, I think, uh, also at the cutting edge in terms of understanding where this field is going. Um, I uh, am not going to spend a lot of time introducing uh, cool. you, Peter. I'd like to Good. just turn it over to you for the discussion. He'll talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, but be prepared to uh, kind of engage um, with them. And um, I think if it, we've learned anything in the past, it's that sort of rich engagement and going deep in these issues that's the real value add of these events. So we're going to try to get to that level of depth as quickly as we can today. So thanks for all being here. Uh, really thank um, Peter and the rest of the panel for being here, and uh, let's let's get moving. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really fun to be here. Um, it's it's um, a really a great break from going down to my office at 18th and M in downtown Washington and opening the Washington Post, which is usually a pretty depressing experience these days. Um, it's also great to be at a uh, in a really a, a wonderful elite uh, institution like Duke um, here inside Fuqua, a uh, business school that we at Brattle Group have known and worked with for a long, long time and admired. And um, Dan has just assembled a fantastic panel that knows much more than me about this, um, which reminds me of a, a, a story about um, an old professor back in, in, in uh, Europe when professors and universities were even more elite than they are now, and they had their own drivers back in those days. And um, this was a professor who was an expert in environmental sciences, and he, kept, he would give pretty much the same talk, and his driver would come in and listen to the talk. And one day he said to his, his driver, you know, I give him the same talk, I get the same questions all the time. Um, why don't you, let's change outfits, and you give my talk for me. And I'll, stay, I'll sit in the back as the driver, and it'll really be fun. And the driver said, well, you know, I've heard it like 25 times. I've heard you listen to, you know, 1,800 different questions. So yeah, let's do it. So they went in, and, the, and uh, sure enough, the driver dressed up as a professor. They didn't know it. He, he did the talk flawlessly. I mean, the audience was very, very impressed. And then they took questions. And somebody raised their hand, and they asked a question. And it was a question that neither the professor nor the driver had ever heard before. It's like totally new. 
So without dropping a beat, the driver said, you know, that's a really silly, such a, such a simple, basic question. And I'm going to have my driver, who's sitting in the back, answer that question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm reserving the right to do that um, with these fantastic panelists who are, who are much deeper in the trenches, or at least every bit as deep in the trenches of the smart grid. And they are some Byzantine and very deep trenches, as I think we'll find out. Fascinating. And changing the whole uh, industry, the electric power industry over a long period of time, as we'll talk about. Um, but um, I'm going to need some help from my, my drivers here. Um, what I have in this talk is a little bit of, a, a little bit of an overview on the book. Uh, smart power, and then a little bit about um, a, a recent study that we've done on the, on the sort of the benefit and cost aspects of the smart grid, which help kind of isolate some of the main smart grid applications um, and uh, kind of show you the kind of economic analysis that we do at Brattle Group, uh, very much applied economics uh, in a policy setting, in a business setting. Uh, these are used for business cases, and um, their business cases in the smart grid space, as our panelists will tell you, are very, very challenging. Um, and then if we have time, I have a few things on um, sort of who the players are in the smart grid space. I don't know if we'll have time to do that, but I will try to move quickly. And um, if it's moved too quickly, just feel free to ask questions at the end, um, and we'll, we'll go, to, go into it. Okay, oops, there, okay, so there is the agenda. Um, I'm sure all of you know this, so I, I won't even cover it, but to say the smart grid is really a whole suite of technologies and applications that, that starts all the way at the power plant, where, where in my opinion, there's smart grid technologies that go right on power plants, neural networks that people are putting on power plants doing amazing things. Uh, if any of you are interested in that, you should look into it. Um, all the way through, um, lots of uh, transmission system technologies that uh, measure power flows much more accurately than they ever have. New digital controls and sensors and computational techniques to control the transmission grid. Lots of substation automation like Rob Caldwell's putting in right now in Florida um, and that he can talk about. Uh, and then all the way into the customer's home where you have all, all kinds of applications um, and one or two that I'll just make sure everybody uh, understands. Uh, <clears throat> there is automated meter reading, AMR, which is basically a simple system for, um, and, and a relatively primitive system that could have emerged in, I don't know, the 80s or the 90s, Rob, is that about right? For um, reading meters with a truck that drives by instead of having to have a meter reader go into the house. But it's sort of 1980s or 90s technology. Um, and it's saved on meter reading expenses and some utilities installed that. That was sort of pre-smart grid. The more modern sort of vintage 2010 version of that is AMI, or Advanced Metering Infrastructure. And that is one of the core smart grid applications downstream, as I call it, down near the customer. And that's, it's the same sort of thing, but there you don't even need to drive by the customer. You can read the meter right, right there back at headquarters through the communication links that actually take the meter data um, and send readings back. Um, and AMR, most AMR systems aren't capable of doing that. You still have to go out and pull the data um, periodically, but you don't need meter readers. Those are important acronyms to, uh, to understand. I mentioned um, that uh, the smart grid is really going to change the power industry. Um, I don't want you to get the notion that this change is going to happen overnight. I think it's going to happen over 20 or 30 years. Um, but um, with that, all that suite of technologies and the ability to monitor and control all the, the energy using applications in this, in, for example, this building in real time. Um, we will be much better at integrating dis distributed generation and storage, um, which will come into increasing use. Um, the use of distributed generation is growing twice as fast as the use in electricity <coughs> overall. 
um, and could grow, I think, uh, probably will grow more quickly than that. Uh, storage is coming behind that. Um, smart Grid improves grid reliability dramatically. Rob can talk about that. Um, it's, we have very good metrics on the ability of all those technologies to make, make it easier to diagnose problems in the grid before they happen. You can actually, with good sensors, you can figure out when a transformer is going, is going to fail before it fails, and you can get out there and switch it out. Um, it's kind of like the lights on your car, the service required light on your car. Um, and there's lots of other reliability enhancing applications of the grid that we could talk about in the panels or in the Q&A. Uh, Plug-in electric vehicles are, are here. It's just fantastic. Uh, a year ago when the book came out, I would say plug-in electric vehicles are coming. And everybody would say, really? Um, now you can put in an order for a leaf or a volt. Um, and um, the, although the penetration will be, I think, quite modest over time and is not going to change electric demand uh, measurably for another 10 years, maybe longer. Um, the smart grid and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are a great synergy and ultimately uh, there will be enormous, enormous benefits from transforming our um, transportation system from petroleum-based to power-based. Um, the smart grid raises incredible cybersecurity and privacy issues. Um, Pete's here from Opower. Maybe he could talk about those a little bit. You probably track those pretty carefully. Um, because, just to give you a flavor for them, because you'll be able to collect real-time data on what energy devices anybody's using in their house, Someone who could tap into that will pretty much know where you are in the house and even what you're doing. If, if you're drying your hair in the bathroom, with a digital signature that guys like Opower can pretty much extract today, they'll know that, you know, somebody's probably in the bathroom. And people, a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with that and certainly are going to require lots of protection um, in there. And, and I think that will be as, as achievable as privacy protections are in any of... Um, are increasingly, you know, digital and uh, completely observed lives. Um, there's also big cybersecurity issues there, as you can imagine, um, the ability to uh, hack into the power grid and cause damage is something of enormous concern um, to the utility industry. It's of concern to the United States government, the, de the, the Defense Department and our security establishment are watching this extremely carefully. They're putting more resources than you would believe into looking at this. And um, that's an issue that we, that we can talk about and, and raising lots of business opportunities. There's lots of startups in that space, of course. Um, but the part of the smart grid that, that the, my book talks about, being a economic economist interested in business strategy and regulation, which all go hand in hand in the industry, is that the smart grid is also going to change the business model of the industry over time. Um, right now, and since the birth of the power industry, the only product that the industry could sell was kilowatt hours, which probably none of you has ever even measured or touched. Yeah, probably maybe one, five or six of you could even tell me how, how big a kilowatt hour is. Um, and yet, that's what you pay when you open up your power bill uh, every month. They tell you how many kilowatt hours you use and you write a check for it. And that's, the, the business transaction's unbelievably opaque and unbelievably simple. And it's been that way for 100 years. That's the power electric utilities business model. They sell you, your contract with them is you can use as many kilowatt hours as you want up to the limit of your fuse box or your circuit breaker box over a month. And at some price level that's set by, usually by state regulators, um, or sometimes by the market, uh, you can pay for them. And that's it. Um, one executive I know likens it to going to the grocery store, filling up your grocery cart, um, and then bringing the cart in and they just weigh it. And you basically pay based on the average cost per pound of all of the products in that food store. 
Um, well, for 100 years, that was the only business model that really was feasible. That's the only one that was technologically and economically feasible. But once the smart grid can, can very, very cheaply and efficiently measure how much you use to, how many kilowatt hours you use to charge your, your electric vehicle and when you use them, how much you use in your kitchen, how much you use for lighting, how much you use for heating and all of those things, you can start charging for different services much like you use on your cell phone. Um, you, could, you could pay for um, a bucket of bits or bytes going into your cell phone. And in fact, they could charge you kind of a commodity and you, don't, you wouldn't care whether you're texting or videoizing or things like that. But that's not generally what you want from your cell phone and not generally what you pay for. You, you pay for a slate of services, so texts and minutes of talk and things like that. And uh, the smart grid will enable that business model. And I think to, to a large extent, the way the industry is going, is, it, the economics of the industry are going to necessitate that. And that's what the book is about. Um, uh, that's the old utility business model. Um, utility would build a plant. In the old days, plants would expand and supply and lower costs and sales would increase. Uh, the regulators would approve that plant going into rates. The utility would, would increase from higher sales, sales of that same commodity uh, that of a kilowatt hours, and it would also profit from higher rate base. Um, I don't know, Dan, where's Dan? Do these guys know how regulation works? Or should I explain it? What do you think, guys? Okay, who knows what a rate base is? Raise your hand. All right, so you guys, I think the about most of the folks know. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, utilities basically are allowed to make profits on their investments. Their total investments are basically called their rate base. And once regulators allow those investments into the rate base, the shareholders' profits are um, basically computed as a sort of a market equivalent return on equity on those investments. And that allowed amount of profit um, is spread across all of their expected kilowatt hour sales. So if they're allowed a million dollars of profit and their expected kilowatt hour sales are a million kilowatt hour sales, every kilowatt hour would, allow to, would be allowed to have a dollar of profit in it along with all their costs. And that's how they make money. Um, of course, it wouldn't be a dollar a kilowatt hour. It would be more like um, a few tenths of a cent or a, maybe a penny of your electric rate is profit. But um, that's how it worked. So if your allowed profit is a portion of every kilowatt hour that you sell, say it's a penny out of your five cent rate, then your incentive as, as an electric utility is to, number one, build more stuff so you, your rate base gets bigger and bigger because that means your total profits get bigger and bigger, and sell more kilowatt hours because in every kilowatt hour, you collect some of that profit. That was the old electric utility business model, the commodity, kilowatt hour commodity business model under regulation. I think um, this, is, this is basically the punchline of the book. Um, that model is going to gradually be replaced by one of two other business models. Um, one of them I call the smart integrator. And here the utility really um, pulls back into being largely a network operator. It doesn't really sell commodity electrons. It runs the network and it lets uh, independent third parties, uh, as we have now in deregulated power markets, um, sell the power over the grid to each home and sort of keep track of how much they're selling to each home um, with all this new metering and, um, and charge accordingly. And the utility really worries about balancing the power grid, making sure that, that, that reliability is preserved. It operates a lot of that smart grid technology. Um, and it markets information, the kind of information that OPower helps utilities with. Markets information um, to everyone using the grid um, and sends price signals, really probably by the minute, out to people as to what power is worth. 
just the same way the stock market, just the way that you can get stock market price, price information um, from lots and lots of outlets. And um, it, in that sort of network operation, it'll be much like the network operators um, in the communication space, many of whom uh, you know, you and I don't interact with, but uh, the, the people who sell us cell phones and buy communication services inter, uh, work, work with those, you know, the um, level threes and all the backbone operators that are out there. Um, a lot of utilities are uncomfortable with this because it removes them from their customers. They become network operators, but they don't, the, the, um, the actual interaction with end use customers is, is left to kind of a market of energy and energy service providers. Um, and they, they're just network operators. And this sort of business model is really the natural evolution of the deregulated power markets around the country and in Europe, where the utilities today don't sell you the actual power and um, that third parties sell you the power but sort of in a smart grid setting where there's much more variation in the kinds of services that you can provide and much more demands put on the, the, the network operator. Um, the, the alternative, which is a more natural evolution of the industry um, in places where power deregulation hasn't been adopted or where it's being un-de-adopted or whatever the proper verb is, um, is uh, a business model I call the energy services utility. And in an energy services utility, the, the move is from uh, a commodity, a seller of commodities, kilowatt hours, to a seller of services, where utilities go to customers and say, you don't want these commodity kilowatt hours any more than you want to weigh your grocery cart. What you want is high quality, in, uh, inexpensive lighting in your home. You want screen hours on all of your screens. You want heating and cooling. You want all these, en these services from energy. So let us come in and really become your advisors and your partners in providing those services. Try to lower your costs, lower your bills. And we have all this metering now and, and sensing equipment um, inside your home and or your commercial building to help you do that. And there, this, this business model is really already starting to be seen in commercial and industrial buildings where lots of these technologies are now in use and third parties and, and utilities can go to those companies and say, we can, we can help you save a lot of money on your energy bill and with no diminution in the quality of your heating and cooling and lighting, let us just help you with that. And, um, you're seeing uh, third parties start to move into the space, and um, I think if utilities don't move into this space, they will be disintermediated. Uh, and I think many of the utilities that we work with around the country are, are aware of this um, and are very concerned about this and trying to figure out how to move this way. So in a nutshell, that's, that's what the book is about. It's about the evolution of the, of the industry through these new business models driven by the smart grid but also, I will mention, um, driven by um, environmental imperatives, notably climate change. Um, I think um, regardless of the fact that at the moment, uh, at, at, a, at the federal level, we're unlikely to see climate change legislation in the next couple of years, I think that the industry will inevitably um, decarbonize um, and uh, over the next few decades, and um, the mechanism may be messy. It's, so far it is messy, but it also looks like it's happening. And that will prompt an enormous amount of investment that will put lots of pressure on the industry and promote the move away from centralized power to more and more decentralized sources. And that will also uh, force changes in the industry along with the smart grid technologies that we're talking about. Um, okay, so let me try and just um, move quickly through this cost and benefit study uh, because I think it will uh, illustrate a little bit more about how we measure the kinds of things the smart grid can do right now. And this, is, this is here and now. This is not 20 or 30 years from now. 
This is a study that we just did for uh, the Edison Foundation, which is the research arm of the power industry um, in Washington. Um, and it's all about looking at the costs and benefits of the smart grid. Um, we created these four prototype utilities, one in each region of the country, uh, with real world load shapes. Load shape means how much electricity is used in each hour. Um, and they were put in different regions, but that's a little bit arbitrary. It's, there's a little bit of stereotyping going on there. So don't think too much of the regions. They have real world load shapes. They each have a million customers. And these are the kinds of benefits that the smart grid's able to deliver sort of in, from, from looking forward over the next 10 years, not out 20 or 30 years. Um, you can get information to customers on their energy use updated daily. Opower does that, puts up these beautiful and extremely user-friendly websites where you can, you can log on and monitor your, your power use and uh, their competitors are doing it too. Um, direct load control. Um, which, where, um, which means that utilities can um, push a button in their headquarters and cycle your air conditioner or your pool pump off periodically um, a few minutes every hour and they cycle yours off for a few minutes and then they move to your neighbors and then they move to the next neighbors and what they do is they bring the total power use down in that hour as they're cycling. You'll never notice it, you know, your pool will be pretty much as clean as it ever was. Uh, your pool pump just went off for a little while. Um, Rob's got one of the oldest systems <laughs> in the world for doing that, but there's very modern systems that can do that. And you can save lots and lots of money, as you will see in that. Um, <clears throat> System-wide ability of a peak time rebate. Um, if, you can, if you can watch a customer's energy use hour by hour, which you can do with these smart grid systems, and you can't do it with a traditional electric meter. Remember, you would just get that monthly bill, and here's how much you used in the month, and we wouldn't know when you used it. We would just add it all up. If you do this, what power companies can give you a rebate if you use less power in peak periods than you were using a year ago. So you pull back your use in peak periods when it's very expensive for them to supply power, and they'll give you a rebate back. Um, you can, you can um, basically crunch the numbers on how much it costs to deliver power during different times of the day. You can compute a rebate that is equal to the cost savings that the utility gets. That means no other customers are getting more or less money. You're just reaping your own savings. That's, basically how peak time rebates work. You can give, and you can give that back in the form of an incentive. Um, <clears throat> similarly, uh, there's a, another way to reflect um, the benefits of shifting your load around and saving your utility money, uh, saving yourself money, is to put in simply higher prices in that peak period and just say, if you use it during that expensive period, you'll have to pay for it. And you'll have to pay pretty much what it costs us. That's a critical peak pricing program. So you can put in something like that. And of course, um, one of the advantages of a smart grid, as I was alluding to, is that you can come home and plug your car in, but you can pre-program it so that the utility will charge it in the middle of the night um, when it's much cheaper for them to, give, to, to charge your car um, versus charging it in this expensive times of the day. It's about a third of the cost, I think, uh, judging from a recent uh, rate. My, my utility, Dominion Electric, just in, in concert with the first volt and leafs coming into my neighborhood, um, ha has just applied for a special rate for charging your car in the middle of the night. And it's unbelievably cheap. It's, 33 cents to charge a car that'll take you 40 miles. That's pretty amazing. If any of you have been to a gas station lately, and I'm guessing most of you have been to gas stations lately, that's a pretty good deal. Um, and it's about three times that or more to charge it, at, uh, even with their normal electric rates, which don't have the critical pricing in them. 
So I don't think uh, we're going to have time to go through to, to do justice to this, but I'm going to, of course, leave these slides with Dan. Um, let me just tell you some of the data inputs that, that we use, we do in a study like this. There's the participation of the, uh, of the different customers opting into these programs, the AMI installation costs, how much it costs to put in the AMI, avoided meter reading costs. Remember I said one of the, the big savings you get from this is that you don't have to send meter readers out with AMI. You can read, it, read the meter every month or really every minute from your headquarters. Uh, you save on building generation capacity because, as I said, when he's controlling those pool pumps and shaving a little power off, power use comes down. When, when guys like us and the utility planning departments look at that, we say, you know, if you put in one of these systems, you can avoid building a power plant for 10 years, um, maybe longer, and that's worth a lot of money because power plants are expensive these days. So there's avoided generation capacity. You, um, you can also avoid having to build fatter, thicker power lines. That's avoided tr transmission distribution capacity. There's the energy price during the critical peak period. Uh, the energy price in the peak period, and you can see the difference. It's um, $120 a, a megawatt hour, which is 12 cents a kilowatt hour. In the critical peak period, six cents in the peak period. Um, and off peak, it's only two cents. So you see how, and those are based on the costs, roughly on the costs of supplying power in those periods. So you can see how much more expensive it is for a utility to supply power during the critical peak period, the very highest 12 or 20 hours of the year, than it is in the middle of the night, a typical off peak period. It's two cents, it's six, six times the difference. You save carbon dioxide emissions, um, and these are average carbon dioxide emissions for utilities, both, and the emissions rates are different peak and off peak, and carbon emission savings are factored into this study. Uh, that's demand for customer and forecast growth rates. So you put all this into a big model, and you get these waterfall charts. And I'll just do one to give you an idea. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, they're so small, I can't hardly read them, so I don't know how you guys will read them. <laughs> I'll try and translate here. Um, the, um, maybe I'll do it from here where I can look at them. And maybe I can, let's see, can I expand them a little bit? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I can get, ah! <coughs> okay, let's look at, here we are, in, I think we're in the south here. So that's a little bit better. Um, the way these charts work is this, this is net benefits and this is present value. So this is discounted over the 20, about a 20 year lifetime of all the equipment that you're going to install and all the programs here. And that's net benefits in millions um, and starts at zero. So the first thing you do is you build the system and the system costs almost $300 million. So you begin with a $300 million investment for all of this hardware. Um, so that's a pretty significant investment. And then you start tallying the benefits. So the first benefit is avoided meter, meter reading costs. And that, over 20 years, saves you almost enough for this utility to basically pay for all these investments. Now, that's a, all, all of these things are very, very case-specific, utility-specific numbers. These are very generic because we did them for the whole industry. But when, when every electric utility goes to its regulators, they have to do a, a bit, this is similar to a mini business case, and they have to do it for their own selves, and it varies a lot. Give you an idea of the variation. This one, I think, is the east side, a different um, one of these examples. And look at the difference here. In, in this particular region, I don't know which one it is. This one is in central. Our database shows it was cheaper to install the system, but you only got about half the savings back um, from your avoided meter reading costs. Whereas you got 80% uh, of the system was paid for just with avoided meter reading costs. Um, but then you have 
um, lots of other benefits. The next benefit is the value of outage avoidance. Remember I was telling you that you can, you can sense when transformers are going to blow out and, and, um, and avoid those outages. And, and outages are expensive. They're, they're inconvenient to us in our homes, but they're very expensive to businesses when they interrupt their production processes. So there, we value the uh, outage avoidance by looking at how many outages of equipment like this avoids on average and what those are worth. You can save some money. You have to send, often in an old traditional utility, you have to send a, a truck out to connect the meter. There's no other way to basically connect or disconnect the meter. You can do that remotely with a smart meter. So you save some money there. That's the remote connect and disconnect. There is a value to customers from having web, um, a web portal, the kind that Opower does, where you can, you can actually save money just getting on that web portal, monitoring your use, setting your thermostats and other things more smartly. Uh, and there's a benefit to that. Um, that benefit is even increased when you have something called an in-home display, IHDs in smart grid lang lingo. <clears throat> which is almost a real-time readout of what you're doing. Instead of having to log on your computer, you can just see that. Uh, I have one in my kitchen, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, this is the value of direct load control, um, and that adds to the benefits. These are the value of peak time rebates and critical peak pricing, and finally the value of electric vehicle charging. So as you add those benefits up, you, you can see you get far into the positive net benefit. Uh, now, this is a, a very, uh, what we economists call a stylized study. So these are all averages, and they all um, assume that you can properly execute all of these programs. And most utilities wouldn't do all of these things. For example, you wouldn't have both a peak time rebate and a critical peak price. Well. You, you could, most utilities don't. They pick one or the other. So um, I don't want you to get the feeling that this is all cut and dry. Uh, just, you know, let's roll out and spend the 300 million because as I said, you have to customize this and you have to look at the ability, the time frame to implement these things. And, and most importantly, as Rob will tell you, you don't just run out and spend the $300 million all at once just like that. Actually, Alan can talk about this too. Um, it's, there's a huge challenge figuring how you stage this investment um, and make sure that over the time period that you're putting the pieces of the communications and control infrastructure that the smart grid represents, over that time frame, you keep everything compatible in a world in which the standards are evolving very quickly um, and are not yet fully in place, technology is evolving very quickly, and utility business models evolving quickly. And then, of course, you have the regulators that you have to um, keep in the loop, and they have to be okay with everything. So, um, in a nutshell, I, I think I'm, I'm really running out of time here, but let me see if I can just wrap up quickly. Um, <clears throat> you can see that those are the benefits from the study. Um, the study's on the web, and... Uh, on the IEE web, and we can talk some more about that. There's one or two other things to just mention if I can. Um, this is just a little taste of the smart grid players and stakeholders out there. Um, if we want to, at some point, um, we can talk some more about this. And um, the, in the slide deck that I'll leave, there's lots of backup material on who are playing in these particular spaces. Um, there is no great proprietary secret to having this. Um, we basically um, tally this from web research, which you guys are probably just as good at as we are. But for those of you doing job searches in this area, we can save you a little work because take a look at the slides. There are um, dozens and dozens of companies operating in this space. Um, I, there, there's going to be, I think, quite a giant shakeout as there is in one of these giant technological booms and waves that run through. But meanwhile, it's just a fascinating space with lots and lots of companies. And they're active in each of these segments. Um, 
uh, at every point along that network that I showed you, from the power plant down to the customer, there are, there are dozens of companies inventing new sort of business models, inventing new products, and trying to get them deployed. Um, there's also, of course, um, and, and somewhat uniquely to the power space, there are lots of stakeholders that are involved in this, and these are real um, gating factors that it, uh, to the changes in the industry as a whole and to the smart grid. Uh, you've got public utility commissions that have to sign off on much of what utilities do. Consumer groups are very, very concerned about the smart grid. They think it's expensive, and they're not sure that the benefits are commensurate with the costs. They also worry that different groups of customers aren't going to see any benefits from the smart grid um, and yet are going to have to pay the costs. In fact, they believe some are going to see disbenefits from the smart grid. I'll mention one just very quickly. Um, <clears throat> consumer advocates um, have spent uh, many, many decades, they will tell you, trying to make sure that um, utilities can't turn the power off in households where there's, in, in, in the winter, when it's dangerous to turn the power off, and people could actually get seriously ill or die even, um, in, you know, house, ho households with young children or the elderly or things like that, to try and put on what are known in the business as shutoff policies. And they are very worried that in the smart grid will make it so easy for a utility to just push a button and disconnect somebody who didn't pay their bill that, that they think it, the smart grid is actually hurting consumers, the consumers that they're worrying about. So you have issues that consumer groups are concerned about. The federal agencies are very, very involved in the smart grid. NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, is chartered by federal law now to adopt all of the technological standards associated with the smart grid. And there is a massive and uh, rapidly evolving effort to try and create um, kind of interoperability between all of the different parts of the system. You got lots of associations and NGOs involved in this thing. And of course, you have the ever-present and ever-important consultants of the world. <laughs> and the equally ever-present and even more important academics and think tanks of the world. Um, and, um, and um, there's, of course, interesting work going on in all of those places. Um, I think that's, that's probably uh, as good a place to stop as any. Um, and um, let's transition to your questions and um, to the panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I, this is obviously a very complex space, but I know many of you I spent time exploring this, so let's open it up to questions and, uh, and with Peter in terms of going a little bit deeper. He, we talked before, and he said it's clearly going to be floating on the surface. So, um, Or sinking beneath the surface, yeah. <laughs> depending on where you are. Yes. So you just mentioned about consumers, and you also mentioned earlier about the uh, smart integrator versus energy services utility. And because of kind of the way that consumers have currently started to react to the smart grid and different smart metering. Do you feel that it may shift more towards the utilities being smart integrators and, and the energy services groups will be more popular with consumers? Because it seems like consumers are more receptive to energy services, um, giving them advice versus utilities in a lot of areas. Now, is, is the, it's kind of the predicate to your question that you're, you have read about kind of like a little bit of a a backlash against smart grid that people are protesting their smart meters? Is that what you were alluding smart to? Smart metering, yeah. yeah. And yeah. specifically addressing two utilities, so getting angry at utilities. Yes. Um, well, you're, you're absolutely right that, that there have been instances in which um, customers have been very angry at their utilities for installing smart meters. Um, it's, it's unfortunate because I think that um, some of that anger is misplaced. But uh, it's out there um, and surprisingly durable. Um, I don't think that anger is going to force one or the other of these business models, although I could see why you would ask that. Um, I think the anger is something that's going, that was sort of going to play itself out over the next five years. And these business models are going to play themselves out over the next 15 or 20 years. And 
I also think that um, although there is a weird phenomenon that I perceive, and this is just purely my personal opinion, and that is that people love to hate their utilities, um, and they do, but at the same time, they trust them. Um, in most cases, now I, I live right next door to Pepco, which is, has a very bad record of repairing uh, power lines during storms. And people are getting very angry at Pepco, and it's the first time really I can remember in decades of seeing that kind of anger towards the utility. So that while they're angry about the smart meters, <coughs> you can't jump from that to say, okay, utility, get out of the business of selling me power. Go away, I want Google and Microsoft and all these um, independent companies to sell me power. That's dr that dynamic of do I want the utility selling me power or the other ones is driven by um, environmental considerations, who's, who's greener, it's driven by, um, the, the, can, can others sell it to me cheaper? And kind of the experience with deregulation, more so than smart meters. That's, you know, so they're kind of different phenomenon, but it's a, it's a very fair question. Diva. Uh, in your modeling, did you include uh, the capex for smart grid in the rate base? Are utilities able to increase rates? Uh, yes. Based on cap Yes, okay. that's that three hundred million dollars is the is the NPV of collecting that investment back in rates. Yes. Uh, could you, so I'll, I'll start by saying I really liked your your grocery cart analogy, um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the adoption of time of use rates and dynamic pricing um, in terms of mandated versus opt in programs. Some utilities have pushed to have mandated time of use pricing, uh, whereas you know, others have traditional opt-in programs. And you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a feel of what the pros and cons of having a mandated versus a, a voluntary program would be. Um, well, first of all, um, the experience. And that is that um, there's almost nowhere where state regulators have mandated time of use pricing yet. They have tried. They, they, even, they have mandated it, and then they've changed their minds back. Um, and it, it's, it's, again, it's a little bit like the smart meter backlash. It's unfortunate, but regulators, they're, because of this 100-year history of, of the grocery cart type electric pricing, which is really, really simple, your power costs you $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour no matter when you use it. Probably almost all of you pay those rates today. And your Mothers and fathers paid them, and your grandmothers and grandfathers paid them, and your great great grandmothers and grandfathers paid them. It was just eight cents. And, and regulators face a lot of complaints when they say, okay, we're changing that from now on. It's 20 cents if you, if you buy power between 12 and eight, be 12, 12 noon and six o'clock at night, which is the peak period roughly. It's, it's more, and then it's cheaper off peak. And there's just a tremendous amount of resistance from various people who think that's just, it's unfair. And um, we at Brattle Group have spent a lot of time on this. There's some very good papers out on exactly which types of customers pay more under these rates uh, and which don't. Uh, and almost virtually every class of customer saves with mandated uh, time of use pricing or dynamic pricing as we call it these days. But it's still um, almost virtually politically impossible to mandate it. Now, I, I think that's going to fade, but at the moment, it's almost all voluntary. Uh, the, the leading edge of this is opt out, where you adopt it and then let you let people come out of um, time of use pricing or critical peak pricing. And that's what regulators are starting to do now in the most advanced jurisdictions. Peter, you didn't talk too much in your presentation, but I know that this group would have interest. How is this playing out in other countries, in, in other markets? I know smart grid is you know, uh, a really important part of the way that China is approaching its build out of an electrical system. How did, can you just talk a little bit, to maybe about China specifically, and how it might be similar or different than what you see here? Well, um, <clears throat> Alan is not my driver. 
But <laughs> I'm Alan. That's Peter. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're you're not my driver, but um, I, IBM has I think much better view of what's going on. They they have an office in China and things like that. So actually, it, why don't you sure come um, to that? China's focus on smart grid is mostly transmission. Mm -hmm. Um, they consider smart and strong to be synonymous. So they talk about the smart, strong grid. Mm. It's mostly about reliability, moving power long distances, mm. and everything in the distribution grid is mostly the same as it would have been here 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They haven't put much intelligence there. And the model about incorporating customer involvement in energy decisions is so far out. <laughs> um, they don't have a smart metering program mm -hmm. yet in the the next five-year plan, we expect to have one, but um, I was there uh, uh, I don't know, two years ago and asked the question about demand response and what we would consider a more elegant way of avoiding blackouts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, we have that program here. We just shut people off. Yeah. <laughs> um, they just think of the blackout as an elegant mm -hmm. way of solving a problem. Mm -hmm. That's changing. I mean, a substantial mm -hmm. shift in two years. Mm -hmm. But they think of investing in intelligence and transmission as absolute must do, and then everything else, they'll get to it in the next five-year plan, I think we'll have advanced metering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's at least five years off, right? That's no, the one well, beyond? The five-year plan is the, the day it comes out, that sort of changes policy. Right. We're expecting it next month. Oh, next, next month. month, okay. So this I this think, next round. Yeah, okay. I think the next five-year plan which will be next month. Okay. Sure. Other questions? Yeah, Mike. I have a question uh, about the regulation of smart grid. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, what are the trends with PUCs? How readily are PUCs signing off on smart grid projects? Um, and in, in your opinion, albeit qualitative, I suppose, um, how prepared are PUCs to uh, regulate smart grid investments? And do you think that there's a certain amount of education or even reorganization that would be necessary? Great question. Um, it, it's hard to generalize about the PUCs. Um, gen at this point, I think they're quite, PUCs across the country are quite resistant to anything that raises power rates. Um, even investments in smart grid that pay off over time. And that's because they're kind of in a surprise, surprise, cost cutting mode with, you know, uh, five years of um, kind of uh, economic decline. And, um, forecasts for electric power use that are very flat. Uh, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable how, to see how electric power demand has dropped in the United States in the economic downturn and how long it's going to take. Uh, you know, there are forecasts that we will not return to our high in electric power rates until, uh, power use, until 2014 and some, and in New Jersey, believe it or not, 2025 before we'll be back to 2005 levels. That's PJM's forecast. That's mind boggling. So with power use not going up and people under great economic duress in this country, which I think all of us either understand and sh should sympathize with, there's a, it's not a good investment climate for, for doing things that are really, really important. So there's generally not a real positive climate for that. But on, but on a case-by-case -case basis, lots of regulators are approving certain investments. Rob's got a big program going. Um, but the way you do it is you have to go to the regulator with a really good, clear business case. And you have to explain to the regulator not only sort of what the costs and benefits are, but also what the risks are. Risk analysis is a huge part of these business cases. And who bears that risk? And um, when you work all that out, you, the regulators are generally, so if it's a modest investment, modest investments have very, very little impact on rates, right? Because these are usually very big systems. And so you're, those are the kinds of investments that are, that are being made. Good, let's have one more question and then we'll take a break and get set up for the panel. Yes, Jim. Yeah, I have a question uh, kind of regarding your consumer acceptance and especially kind of like from a energy services perspective and like brands. I feel like a lot today, you know, you kind of get a lot of like traditional players like IBM, Cisco, trying to get into the smart grid space. But at the same time, you also have like a lot of new companies like Opower, or like Zigbee that are like popping up. And I, I'm curious of your thoughts of how much do consumers, is there a part of like, will they, will they trust a smart grid, you know, 
enterprise if it's set up by a more established company, or do you feel it's better to have a newer kind of on the scene company drive um, you know installations and maybe you know calm people's <coughs> presentations about the smart grid? Well, that that's the sixty four billion dollar question that drives whether the industry will end up in a smart integrator realm where the new entrants have disintermediated and basically blown utilities away from the customer and own that whole relationship and manage it and extract value from it, or where the utilities stay, stay in that space. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, it's sort of the utilities game to lose, in a sense, because they have a, a, a century-long bond with their customers. Um, that's really quite strong, and, but utilities are, I think, are also lack um, most of the core competencies that are going to be needed in the new world to interact with customers so differently, simply because they're not used to it. Whereas a lot of new startups come out of consumer marketing, um, you know, O Power uses techniques that it's drawing from everyone but the power sector. Um, so, you know, when I, when I did the book, I said, you know, it really, I can't call this. I'm not gonna say this is the future of the power industry because the, if the power industry wakes up and kind of um, absorbs the smartest um, developments and actions and habits of these kind of new startups, uh, they'll basically stay in that space. And that's the thing to watch. I don't know how, how and, and since the book, two years now, I still think the, I still think the game is on. But uh, I worry a lot, of, since I, I like the regulated utility model for policy reasons, um, I, I, I worry about the nimbleness of utilities. And I, I, I do say in the book that I give 60, 40 odds to the smart integrator scenario. I still do that, maybe 65, 35. One of the utility players I was talking to in the last couple of weeks talked about the next decade really being the battle of uh, incumbent capitalism. That it's the incumbents versus the newcomers and how that's going to sort itself out is really the, going to be the trajectory that the system takes. So I think you're starting to get at some of those. Let me just queue up the final activity. The last hour, what we want to do is break up into groups looking at uh, the various constituencies here, from the utilities, to industry, to end consumers, to the general public, as being sort of potential beneficiaries of the smart grid, but that each of them would also have a view on what the barriers are for uh, uh, achieving some of those benefits, and what some of the risks are that would come with um, taking these on. So we're going to break up into four groups at the, uh, in the last hour, in, uh, along each of those categories, to begin to play this out. I want to sort of tune you for the panel discussion as we go through this to try to listen through the, through the ears of those different players and what they're looking for from Smart Grid, what they would resist in Smart Grid, what some of those barriers and risks are. So keep that in mind as we go into the next phase. Let's take a five minute, no more than five minute break um, and we'll get things set up for the panel discussion here and then we'll come back and jump in. All right, thanks. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.